So I'm Benjamin Tsfa. I work for Red Hat. I'm also the heat maintainer. And I'm going to talk about a thing that uh, is named heat BPF. So first, before to start sending tomatoes or whatnot, uh, this is still a work in progress. Uh, currently, I'm at the V5 of the series. Uh, the API is mostly designed, but you can just pick up your laptop and try with it uh, because it's not there yet. So, uh, heat BPF is heat plus BPF. Yeah. So the agenda would be a little bit of primer about heat, then heat BPF, and then why I'm introducing this, uh, what it is, how you can use it, and finally uh, how it was made. So HEED, uh, for those who don't know, it's a plug-and-play protocol for input devices. And it stands for Human Interface Devices. It's a Windows 95 era protocol for handling plug-and-play USB devices being mice keyboards. Basically, whenever you bought your brand new Windows 95 computer, uh, you've got your uh, brand new keyboard. And if you have a floppy disk to install on your co computer, it's kind of a problem. So you would like to just plug it, it works. Nowadays, we've got a lot more transport layer on top of, instead of USB. We've got Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Emission, I2C, Intel and AMD sensors also doing stuff. And there is even an SPI driver in progress. And the nice thing is that most devices nowadays are working with generic driver. Yay. How this can be done is because of the key report descriptor. I don't need you to actually read the entire thing. Well, I'll go through it a little bit. But what's important is that the device has a memory in its flash uh, that actually um, tells and teach the host, the computer, uh, its language. So in this particular case, uh, the first few lines we say, okay, this device is a mouse and it's supposed to be a pointer. So you know that you are supposed to map this into a cursor on your screen. And then the first five bits in the report are going to be the buttons. Then we've got three bit of padding, of course, because you always need padding. And then we've got X and Y, and uh, each of those two events are 16 bits. And so on, so on, we will, and so on. The important bit is that this is static, it's stored in every single device, and that's what the host needs to know to be able to understand what the device does. If you're more interested, there are a lot of documentation around. The first one is the device class definition. Last update was in 2001, more than 20 years ago. Uh, it defines all of the operational model that you can have with, uh, with a heat device, what you can do to talk to it or retrieve the various descriptors, um, how to report the, the report descriptors, do the requests, and so on and so forth. Anyway, it's a somewhat stable protocol. Okay. On the other hand, you also have the heat usage table, and this is the fast moving target. Last update was in 2021. And this one defines how uh, you map the various usage in the report descriptor. So for instance, X and Y are defined in uh, 30 and 31 X. It is extended continuously by companies. Uh, the most disruptive change were the following ones, the multi-touch protocol, the universal, universal stylus interface pens, and the hardware sensors. But in most cases, whenever there is an update in this document, we just have to do to add a new hash defined kernel and add a proper mapping. So it's really a small change in the code. Okay. So why did it work? Um, most devices nowadays are working with generic drivers, except for a few. Half of the driver in the current heat subsystem need a fix up in the report descriptor. The first, the first byte data that I showed you, sometimes they just say, oh, well, I don't know what to do with this key, so let's just use something else. And to convince you that they are not doing a lot, half of the drivers are under, under 100 line of codes, which means that they are really not doing a lot when you're coding with C. And for example, um, uh, one driver just changed the one of the input mapping in heat riser, so it was a brand new driver just for one key. Okay. And so I was attending kernel recipes for a few edition, and was seeing all this weird guy talking about BPF all the time. And so I'm actually glad that this is the first talk about BPF to, uh, for this edition. And I was thinking in my head, 
can EBPF help me there? Because it seems like there is something we can do. So given that it's the first talk about BPF, what is BPF? You'll get a more uh, detailed presentation uh, from Alexei tomorrow. Um, but basically, if you, I, I really like the definition of the Cilium project, uh, which says that BPF is a highly flexible and efficient virtual machine-like construct in the Linux kernel, allowing to execute bytecode at various hooks point in a safe manner. It is used by in a number of Linux kernel subsystems, most prominently networking, tracing, and security. In other words, it allows to add safe kernel space code from the user space if you have root access. So, it plus BPF, what it is? It's basically using BPF in heat readers to have user space driver fixes in the kernel. Before we start saying, hey, what's happening there? Uh, these are the few principles that uh, define the entire frame of heat BPF. First and foremost, I'm only working on an arrays, on arrays of bytes, and I'm only talking heat. That was what was problematic to me, um, because as soon as you start talking about drivers, you want to have access to input, to LEDs, for feedback, and this kind of stuff. If you want to introduce BPF in your subsystem, you have to stick to your subsystem. So I've got heat input, I transform it eventually, and I return heat. I don't have any access to any other subsystem. Any smart processing that can happen at the heat level, like if I want to parse the report descriptor, this is not part of the BPF. This is part of the user space. User space has to parse the report descriptor or the programmer. Given that the report descriptor is written once in flash of the memory, you can completely write one program that does everything and uh, you don't even have to pause the report descriptor. You just realize, hey, this device is this one, so I can just use uh, X at this particular value. Um, I also want to execute one PPF program and attach it specifically to one device. Uh, just in case in the future we have hundreds of devices and hundreds of BPF programs, I do not want to iterate over all of them. Uh, one important point is that we need to unfold GPL program with BPF, and guess what, we get that for free with BPF because we are talking to the kernel, and the kernel is exported as GPL functions. And I do not want to users to have LLVM, and so program needs to be CORE, which is compile once, run everywhere. So basically you compile, you compile the program, you can provide the bytecode and ship it in any kernel, as long as you've got the proper APIs. So why? Why am I using heat BPF? Um, there are four ca use cases that I'm going to present here. The first one is, in my opinion, it's going to introduce a more convenient and more simple way to do fix and user testings. Okay. Nowadays, what it means to add a new quirk in the heat subsystem, you've got a device a keyboard that has a broken key. You first have to identify the issue. Then you have to either write yourself a patch in the heat subsystem or you have to ask somebody to write a patch for you. And you have to test it. And users need to recompile the kernel, which is a hard task as we saw yesterday. Then we need to submit the patch to the LKML. We need to do the review of the patch. Uh, we need to do eventual some changes, and we need to ask the user to re recompile the kernel. And then we include the patch in a branch. That's classic development. We schedule it either for this cycle or for the next one. Then the patch goes into the industry. The kernel is either marked as stable because it's, thick, it's a new driver, for instance, or the patch is backported into stable. The distributions are taking the new kernel, and only now the user can drop the custom kernel build which means that for the whole time between the identification of the issue and the, f the time for the, for the bug to be fixed upstream, the user still has its own custom kernel build for this one key that is broken on this particular device that he might not use. So what it means to have this with BPF? We will still have to identify the issue, we will still have to write something, except that it's not a proper patch, it's a BPF program that will be created, and the user would just drop the bytecode into the file system, whether the user compiled it or not. Yeah, it depends. To give you an idea, this is what I'm looking for. 
this is very sim simple things. You get an array, you just change one byte in it, and you return zero. I'm not looking for anything more fancier in this, uh, in this system. And the interesting bit is that now that the user has his device fixed, the user can still continue to use it regular kernel updates, CVEs that are fixed and whatnot. But then the developers are continuing to include and ship the fix within the kernel tree directly. So we submit the patch in the DLKML, we review the patch with the BPF program, we include the patch in the branch, we ship it, and so on and so forth, and these versions are taking the new kernel. Second use case, heat firewall. If you have Steam installed on your machine, good for you, the problem is that it installs a UDEV rule that says every game controller device I know are gonna get you access, which means that you're gonna open to the entire world access to your game controller, which is okay for like, okay, you've got a classic gamepad that doesn't do much, okay? But if you have like, for instance, a DS5 controller or any PlayStation controller, I think, they have this tiny bit which is called firmware upgrade that you can do. The problem is that what prevents Chrome or JavaScript polling to actually talk to the heat device and start the firmware upgrade and start messing up with your device? So you just bought an $80, uh, I don't, can't remember exactly the same the price, but you just brought a brand new controller and somebody just kills you, kills the controller, sorry. So that's not good. With heat BPF, what we can do is we should be able to fix and to, to detect, okay, this device, this application is actually trying to access the firmware update point. Nope, it should not, and we just reject the request. Also, we would be able to change the device based on the user context. The example that I have here is this tiny bit of uh, device. It's a nice one. It's a pack from Microsoft called the Surface Dial. It's a rotary knob, um, very nice. In the kernel, we export it as a rotary knob, but the problem is that user space doesn't use it because none of the developers working on the user space stack have it. So basically, we implemented stuff in the kernel for it, and you can't use it because, eh, why not? So what you can do with BPF, though, is given that you know that it has haptic feedback and it has quite a high resolution, why not use it as a wheel on a mouse? So with hit BPF, you can change the device into a mouse with high resolution and use it to scroll your web page. Hey. And suddenly, if you have a menu, you can enable the haptic, have one click per five degrees, and use it differently. The interesting bit here is that the kernel cannot make this decision for you because we don't know how you're gonna use the device and we cannot really lie to the user space because if we start saying, okay, well, let's convert this surface layer into, into a mouse, that means that we are lying to the user space and at some point, user space will want to revert the change that we did in the kernel, which is <laughs> terrible. Last but not least, on the example that I have here is tracing. In the heat subsystem, we have hydro, which is nice. It works well, but it's not enough. It's not enough for a couple of reasons. Some drivers are simply disabling hydro. And also the problem is that hydro is a one-to-one -one con communication between the process and the device, which means that we don't know what's happening outside of our process. With BPF, we are in the kernel, we should be able to get an overview of who is accessing the device and what they are doing. So, how does it look like? Already shown one, but uh, let's start with this one, which is more uh, common for the BPL folks. Um, so, let's say we have a device and we want to change the incoming data flow. Like, for instance, we've got the X coordinate of the mouse that is inverted. We can just introduce this tracing PPF program in the, in the kernel and attach it to the device. What we do is we do a get data and we change the data in it and we return zero and the data is modified on the fly. This is executed before any other driver processing. Uh, so that's one interesting bit is that from the user space point of view, everything happened as if, as if it was not here. To be able to attach the BPL program to our device, currently what I have is I have um, I have a syscall BPL program 
that I need to, un to, to, to write in your PPF code and you need to actually attach the device uh, into uh, so the program FD to the device um, that you identify by this system unique ID. One of the interesting bits is that you can load more than one program for the device event. So this is a dumb example because you do not want to have two programs for X and Y. But what is interesting is that you can have a firewall, a device fix up, and you can also have a tracing program. And you don't have to recompile them together to have everything working properly. So the use case for this one, for the device event, it's, benef it's useful, for instance, if you have a uh, joystick that is quite old and is drift the one of the joystick is drifting, uh, you could set up a neutral zone and don't wake up user space anytime you've got uh, an event that, is, that should not be there. You can also fil filter out unwanted fields in a stream, and you can uh, fix the report when something should not happen. If you have uh, an old mouse with a bouncing button, and you are able to detect it for via some, I don't know, a way of common filter or whatever you want, or just saying, oh, it's not possible that the user, user is doing that. You can just filter out whatever you want. The second interesting bit with HitBPF is that you can change how the device looks on all. This is the Surface Dial example, and this is what I shown previously. You can change the report descriptor. So basically, we can turn the device from something to something else. Uh, we are still using the same API, which is HitBPF get data, and this time data contains the report descriptor of the device. The interesting bit here is that whenever you load and you attach this program to the device, the program gets disconnected and reconnected with the new um, with the new uh, uh, description. And of course, we can only have one program of this type uh, because otherwise uh, it would be a mess to understand what is doing what. So with that, you can fix a bogus report descriptor. Uh, if a key is not properly mapped, or like if this, the device says, hey, this key is constant, except it's not. You can morph the device into something else. Um, and you can also change the device language. If you you can do fun things there. Um, yeah. And last, but not least, uh, what you want to do is probably you want to be able to communicate with the device. So for that, you still have to introduce a syscall PPF program. And then you have to allocate a context because when you're on syscall, you don't have the context. Well, you sort of have it, but it's uh, not the context that we are interested in. We want to do the mapping with the heat device. And then you can use heat BPF for our request and do whatever you want in it with the data that you provide to it. Heat BPF hardware request is the exact same behavior than the internal function heat hardware request, if you know the heat API, uh, which means that it cannot be used in interrupt context, which means uh, that whenever you want to query device information or put the device into a specific mode, this needs to be initiated from the user space, not directly from the kernel. We cannot do some direct uh, communication between two. OK, how? Really fast. Um, so last, uh, the last, the last point is about uh, how I managed to get that. And uh, the architecture of heat BPF is interesting now because thanks to the work from Alex and all of the other BPF folks, uh, we can pretty much um, map any subsystem or attach any. No, the other way around. We can attach BPF to any subsystem uh, with. Uh, Two functionalities: the allow error injection API and the kfunk API. Of course, currently uh, I'm missing a few BPF core features uh, that are addressed in the patch series, so I'm, I won't uh, go too deep in, into detail there. Um, but this is on the back and not really interesting there. So what is a low error injection? Uh, basically, it's introducing a trace point in the kernel code that can, that can be tweaked by the by eBPF. It has a lot of other uh, use, but for my case, it's eBPF, so that's why I'm focusing there. Uh, it's introduced by a programmer to give in place in the code. Uh, it is completely voluntary. You do it on your own, and you exactly know what you're doing. So what it means? is that on the left, you've got the kernel module itself, on the right, the BPF program. 
Uh, it's a simple function that you have to declare. It's a no inline function. You have to declare it as weak so that it works. And you tag it with hollow error injection. Then you've got your regular processing function uh, that does stuff. And at the very beginning of your function, you say, hey, if my trace point returns an error, you just abort. And by default, if you don't attach any BPF program to it, it doesn't do anything. But if you attach a BPF program to the, to the right, you can do a test on the event. Something happens. You return an error code. And then that means that my trace point will this time return an error, which means that you can actually interrupt the kernel flow of processing directly from the BPF program. The other interesting bit are KFUNCs. KFUNC is quite recent. I, I won't ex can't remember exactly when it was introduced. Um, but basically, it allows you to export a kernel function as an eBPF dynamic API, which means you don't have to update eBPF anymore if your uh, intent is to add a function to a subsystem, which means that you let the BPF folks on their own way, you are doing on, on your own side, and it's everybody gets happy. However, of course, kernels need to be taken. It's a syscall, definitely a syscall. Um, so all of the uh, problems of a syscall are um, there. But the interesting point is that eBPF takes all of the cumbersome part away, because eBPF would ensure that you're coding the function with the right arguments in terms of uh, structs and uh, parameters. Not um, You have to check the values, but uh, you're sure that the function is called with the, the correct uh, um, types. If the call is not there, the BPF program won't load. That's it. Uh, all of the versioning is also somehow integrated with all of that, because if you change the, if you change your struct, then the, the BPF program would say, okay, I'm using a different struct, so now I just can't use this same function with the same name uh, because it's not the right parameters. So how does it look like? It's slightly more complex, um, not so much, but still. Uh, so you still have to define a non-inline function so that the kernel compiler doesn't uh, strip it away. Um, you then add it to a BTF uh, set. And once you add it to the BTF set in your module init function, you register the BTF set with BPF core. And then in the BPF program, uh, you, of course, you include vmlinux.h, and uh, you also redefine your function as a ksim. That's the small bit here. That is quite important. Um, and then you just call this function as if it were a properly BPF API. I was supposed to do 35 minutes and it's not going to 23, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Wrapping up. Summary. Um, the goal here is to simplify easy fixes in the kernel. Um, I want to allow to add user space defined behavior depending on the context. So all of the decisions that we cannot take in the kernel, user space can take it from for us. We can also add, of course, traces in the event, even if we have k-probs with F trace, all this kind of stuff, it's much more convenient to have a full API to, to, to get uh, to there. It will allow to have live fix without having to update the kernel. Uh, this is that something that happens when I have my Red Hat uh, employee uh, etiquette, which is basically uh, we are updating every six months. It's a problem. Um, so fixing devices directly is, is a nice thing in the same way of live patching. Kind of. uh, it would, as a maintainer, I'm particularly interested in this one because it would allow me to remove any custom kernel API for any particular device because I can tell people, okay, look, instead of having a module parameter for this one, just add your BPF program for your particular API that you need, which means that I don't have to um, take care of those in the long term um, because the user space is responsible for its own API. And of course, it will not replace internet drivers uh, for some devices. For instance, if your device is completely broken at boot time and we cannot actually ship the BPF program in it, we can't do it. 
um, or if your device actually needs a driver, like either MI or the Wacom driver for input tablets, it will definitely not replace those because uh, as soon as we need some communication between um, the BPF program and user space, it's not going to be uh, this. And that's it. <laughs> so, any questions? Um, so I was curious, assuming that um, someone provides me a BPF program fixing my broken hit device um, and I would like to upstream such a fix into the kernel, the uh -huh. BPF program get turned into a C code then and applied as a patch to the Linux inputs drivers? So the idea, the idea that we have is uh, that, so BPF program is our C equivalent code, so we can put them in a patch for, for, no, for no issue. Uh, what you can do also, and what HitBPF is doing right now, is you can actually load a BPF program from the kernel mm -hmm. and talk to it. So the idea is that uh, we would uh, fix the BPF, so fix the device, provide the BPF program, ship it as a, as, as a patch in the kernel tree, and also provide some auto tooling that would convert the BPF program, the same BPF code, into a module uh, that would be dynamically generated based on the BPF program. Mm -hmm. And so it would be a regular kernel module, except that this kernel module would load the BPF program for you. So we actually distribute the BPF program within the kernel tree. So that will make the BPF support in kernel basically mandatory? Sorry, can you repeat uh, that? That will make the BPF support in kernel basically mandatory? Um, for some devices, yes. Yeah, got it, thank you. Um, so w when you say allowing to add user space to find behavior, do you mean letting user space choose which BPF program to load, or do you mean user space actually like sending information to BPF to make a decision? No, the 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 idea is that so so we got I've got an a an hybrid approach. The the small fixes would be loaded by the kernel. For the for the for the fixes, where like like if you just want to fix the report descriptor, it should be loaded by the kernel, and that's it, and you forget it, and it's it's done. Um, for uh, for instance, we've got an example with the USI pens, where like we need to actually talk to the device and change the parameters on the pen themselves directly, and so it would be entirely the responsibility of the user space to load that program inside the kernel. Okay. I'm working on um, a new map type in BPF uh, for user space to send messages to BPF programs. So it's like the ring buff, but it goes in the other direction. Okay. Um, I don't know if that might be something that could be useful for Maybe. this as well. Uh, so just always on your radar. Yeah, cool, cool. Seems interesting. Any other questions? Yeah. So, so how does the distribution work? Like when you have a fix with a BPF uh, fix, like how does the uh, distribution, like a, like a like Ubuntu or something, how can they distribute these these fixes? Like uh, so, if if they are distributed in tree, uh, like simple fix, there it's it's just a regular kind of update. Right. So for the users, it doesn't change anything. Uh, it only change for the user who actually start the initiate the process of fixing the, the, the device where like this one actually needs to have this. But we could also ship those device, those fixes through UDEV or through systemd or this kind of stuff, but right. going through the kernel is actually the most sensible way for those. So no difference from people. It's uh, partially related to the previous question, but uh, don't you fear that uh, it to discourage some users from uh, uh, um, upstreaming their changes, because it encourages an approach which consists in uh, deploying a quick fix locally and forgetting about it. Yes, I mean uh, the, the the one thing I'm aware of is that it's completely opening the Pandora box. Um, it's maybe uh, some user will do that. Uh, hopefully, hopefully some user will still continue to contribute if they have this local fix and they want to, to, to continue to it. 
the biggest interest I see for me is that uh, I will be able to provide fixes for users without having to recompile the entire kernel or ask them, okay, can you try this particular kernel, this kind of stuff. So yes, that's a risk. In the same way, it's a risk that suddenly um, any hardware vendor starts uh, building in an entire um, uh, an entire big thing that is completely ugly and completely in BPF. Yes, that's true. But I think the the pros are against the cons. Yes, very likely. But uh, we are just perceiving this little risk. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. There's a question behind you, Willy. I'm not sure I understand. Um, when you pr uh, when you distribute the BPF programs in tree, do you distribute just the source files, and people will then need LLVM to actually what? compile them, or will you also have the binary in there? So my plan is still not implemented yet. That's why it's a it's a work in progress. My plan is that we submit the BPF patch, the the BPF program as a patch. And alongside with the patch, we have to run some tooling that would also add the loader of the patch itself. So we would compile the bytecode of the BPF directly in tree, add this in the patch, and then have the loader directly load the thing. So it's exactly the same. Than, I mean, exactly, not exactly the same. Um, we might be able to also compile the BPF program at compile time. Um, this is not what is currently done in the in the other BPF program that are preloaded, um, but we've got a lot of opportunities. But the idea is that you do not have to have Clang and LLVM installed on the user space. Okay. Any other questions? I think that's it then. All right, thank you.